Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the event um, on the alternatives to, um, to EAW, to European Arrest Warrant and Pretrial Detention in EU cross-border proceedings um, hosted by Fair Trials. Uh, my name is Ilse Traumak, and I am a legal and policy officer for Fair Trials, leading our work on pretrial detention in Europe. Um, just um, a quick start. For those less familiar with Fair Trials, we are an international non-governmental organization based in London, Brussels, and Washington, D.C., and our mission and work is to fight for fairer and more equal criminal justice systems here in Europe. We work closely together with a large network of criminal justice experts, of lawyers, of partner NGOs and academics to monitor law and practice, spot emerging threats and to get comparative insights in what, in insights that inform um, our various um, forms of advocacy. And at the very start of the, of the event, just a couple of quick remarks on our work on pretrial detention in Europe from my side. Over the last 10 or so years, the European Court of Human Rights has issued about eight pilot judgments on inhuman and degrading conditions in European prisons. Almost all of them have one common trend, and that is overcrowding. The simple truth is that European prisons at the moment are full. They are full to the extent that living in them calls in question human dignity, the very value that we have placed in the heart of our legal systems. But even if prisons are not overcrowded, incarceration has immense negative effect on people's physical and mental health, family ties, ability to work, and ultimately the ability to enter back into the society. For those awaiting trial, it's much harder to use their rights, um, their defense rights um, and prepare an effective defense, which is essential for even having a chance of a fair and equal trial. One of the main reasons for overcrowding is the overuse of pretrial detention. More than a fifth of those incarcerated in Europe at the moment are still waiting for the final judgment. For example, in Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy, Denmark, and Ukraine, every third person in prison is a pretrial detainee. Our work shows that in Europe, that pretrial detention is applied quickly and it is applied easily. It is often based on generic reasoning that repeats legal grounds and repeats assumptions about the need to detain, such as a flight risk or risk of reoffending. Pretrial detention is often used as a measure of first resort because it is familiar to law enforcement. It is established and it is very easy to use. Arrest and detention in cross-border cooperation, as we will hear in today's event, is no different. More than a decade after their adoption, the alternative cross-border cooperation mechanisms are still largely unused, while the European arrest warrant is at risk because of fundamental rights, concerns, not least of them in human conditions in overcrowded European prisons. We need cross-border mechanisms to work. They can be a valuable tool if they are used in a way they were intended to be used based on mutual trust and to fight serious crime. But for that, we need to change our approach to detention and step out of the familiarity of usual practice. Without further ado, let me give the floor to Laure Baudrillard Girard, first Fair Trials Legal Director for Europe, who will introduce you in more detail to the research on the alternatives to EAW that Fair Trials and its partners have carried out over the past year. Thank you. Laura, please. Thank you very much, Ilza, and hello to everyone. So, yes, as Ilza said, the European arrest warrant is regarded as the, the flagship EU judicial cooperation measure, and it was adopted to tackle serious cross-border crimes as a fast-track system for the arrest and extradition or surrender of a person to stand trial or to serve a sentence, a prison sentence, in another member state. 
But the EOW also has severe implications for the person's concerns. It involves the arrest and deportation of a person for the purposes of standing trial or to serve a sentence in a country where that person is not located. And it typically involves detention in the country of arrest as well as in the country where the person is deported. And deprivation of liberty is amongst the harshest measures that states can take against per people. And to be legitimate, such measures should only be imposed in exceptional circumstances as a measure of last resort. And in addition to the loss of liberty, because of the long distance in a cross-border setting, people will often face on top of that separation from their families, potential job loss, and may be sent to a country where they have no social ties, no support system, or even don't speak the language. So recognizing the severe implications of an EAW, the EU adopted four alternative measures which judicial authorities can resort to in cross-border settings, both at the pre-trial trial stage and at the post-sentencing stage. And I'll take a few moments um, for those who are less familiar with them to take you briefly through them. So at pre-trial stage, we have two measures that can serve as alternatives to the EAW issued for prosecution. So the first is the European Investigation Order of 2014, which was due to be transposed by member states by May 2017. And the EIO, very briefly, allows authorities in one member state to collect and transfer evidence to another member state. And this includes the ability for states to gather testimonies via video links without the need to request that individuals be physically transferred. And this alternative is particularly useful to prevent the use of EAWs for investigative purposes before a case is ready to go to trial, which we continue to see. The second alternative at a pretrial stage is the European Supervision Order, much older, of 2009, which allows a judicial authority in a member state investigating an offence to ask the state where the person is resident to monitor compliance with pretrial supervision measures. So they could be specific prohibitions or obligations um, pending trial. So this measure allows a person to remain in their state of residence until the trial takes place. And at the post-trial stage, at the sentencing stage, we, are, we have two further measures that have been adopted to serve as alternatives to the EAWs where these are issued for the purposes of serving a sentence. The first is the framework decision on the transfer of prisoners, which was adopted back in 2008 to provide a system of, for transferring persons with custodial sentences back to their member state of nationality or residence or to another member state where that person has strong ties. And the second is the framework decision on probation and alternative sanctions, which allows for the transfer of a sentence person to a different member state to serve a non-custodial sentence imposed by the state of trial. So we have these four alternative measures. And what's really interesting to see is that um, through these different cross-border cooperation instruments, we have two broad policy objectives. The first is obviously to support law enforcement to cooperate by making extradition quicker and easier. Um, and in principle, to make that possible in the fight against serious cross-border crime. And on the other hand, we have another objective here. It's to recognize that there are broader uh, purposes to criminal policy beyond security and beyond punishment, there's a recognition in these alternative instruments that people may well be innocent, and even if they are found guilty, that sentences are not just about punishment, they're not just about prison, they're also about rehabilitation after sentencing, and rehabilitating in a state where someone has no ties is simply not possible. So these instruments are very interesting because they're an expression of a more comprehensive EU criminal justice policy that looks beyond cross-border cooperation between authority, authorities and seeks to be fair and more humane. And in parallel to these instruments, the EU has also issued guidance the EAW handbook, for instance, that's addressed to judicial authorities, which cites the importance of considering alternative instruments when deciding whether to issue an EAW by virtue of the principle of proportionality, a general EU law principle which requires the last, least restrictive measure to be adopted. And furthermore, the EU has also adopted six directives on procedural safeguards of suspects and accused persons, which apply to cross-border proceedings and should enable effective challenges to the EAW and access to alternative instruments because they effectively enable access or they are intended to enable access to a legal representation and legal aid in both issuing and executing states. And we all know how important the role of lawyers is 
to make such requests for release and for alternatives to detention where necessary. However, the EU did not adopt any common standards on detention. So the decision to place a person requested under an EAW in detention is left up to national laws. And worse still, in our view, we have this Article 12 of the EAW framework decision, which effectively reads as supporting a principle of detention and only as an exception, an alternative. And our research has shown, or rather more, I should say much more humbly, simply confirmed what plenty of other research and reports have shown over the years. And that is that the detention culture that prevails at domestic level is present and even intensified in a cross-border setting. So thanks to funding by the European Commission Justice Programme, we've uh, been able to carry out research in five different countries, Austria, Belgium, Greece, Ireland and Luxembourg, a choice that we made to reflect different situations. On the one hand, Luxembourg, Greece and Austria, countries um, in Europe where we have the highest proportion of non-nationals in detention and who have transposed all four instruments on alternative measures. Then we have Belgium, similarly, very high rates of foreigners in detention, but only recently transformed, uh, transposed the European supervision order. And then we have Ireland in comparison, a low number of non-nationals in detention and a lower number of pretrial detainees in general. And yet Ireland has only very recently incorporated some of the alternative instruments and opted out of the EIO. So we were very lucky to be able to pursue research despite the lockdown, thanks to our partners, who would like to thank today, the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Fundamental and Human Rights for Austria, the Centre for European Constitutional Law for Greece, the Irish Council for Civil Liberties for Ireland, and the European Institute of Public Administration for Luxembourg, as well as Cecilia Rixala from the Université de Saint-Louis for Belgium. So we conducted qualitative research through interviews and surveys and con collected quantitative data where available, but this is largely limited, which is a problematic finding in itself. And many of the contacted stakeholders, another problematic finding in itself in the methodology, and especially lawyers, consider themselves not knowledgeable or even aware of the alternative instruments and decline to be interviewed, which revealed the lack of uh, knowledge from the outset amongst practitioners in relation to these instruments. But we still managed to make some findings, and so I'd like to highlight our four key findings. First, the alternative measures have failed to limit the use of European arrest warrants for prosecution because of this quasi-automatic recourse to detention for persons who are not nationals or residents of the country where the prosecution is taking place. So the place of residence outside the country of investigation and trial leads to a presumption of flight risk that will justify the need for a national arrest warrant, which in turn is then automatically translated into an EAW alternatives or the possibility that the person may not even require any restrictive measures don't appear to be often considered. And the unequal treatment that people face in criminal proceedings in the EU, depending on their place of residence or nationality, is not a new issue. It has long been known and recognized by the EU when they adopted the alternative instruments. Because in the EU area of freedom, security and justice, people can move freely across borders. And however, if they are subject to an investigation, they are more likely to be arrested and detained because they have chosen to live and work in another member state. So the fact that they've exercised their right to free movement within the EU is then used against them to justify the necessity for arrest and detention under an EAW. And because of the large discretion that, ju ju just, sorry, that judicial authorities and prosecutors tend to have in domestic law in respect of pretrial detention, there are no adequate safeguards to prevent bias against foreigners. Second, um, the second key finding, our research also shows that judges, prosecutors and lawyers lack faith in the use of alternatives to detention. Put simply, there is limited mutual trust between countries to confer the supervision of alternatives to detention to services from another member state, something that is also largely documented at domestic level between domestic authorities as well. And this lack of trust from our research comes from lack of knowledge about how systems function in other member states, as well as a lack of institutionalized cooperation between judicial actors that enables, for instance, exchange of information. And this is particularly problematic for supervision or probation orders, which require continued coordination and consultation between competent authorities. Uh, 
Practitioners did recognize in our research the crucial role played by Eurojust in ensuring a European network, but noted that too often cooperation between judicial actors remains very informal and highly dependent on the state, authority, or even the individual agent concerned. We also noted that neighboring countries tend to have generally stronger ties and better channels of communication. Our third key finding is that there are fundamental gaps in the EU and domestic implementing legal frameworks. In particular, there is no legal requirement to consider proportionality of the EAW, which means that there is no requirement as such for authorities to consider alternatives. Then there is a lack of harmonization in relation to the alternatives available in member states in terms of conditions, procedures and practice. And this lack of harmonization makes it difficult for practitioners to rely on alternatives because they just don't know enough about them. Then we also note that there are gaps in effective implementation of procedural safeguards, particularly dual access to lawyer in both issuing and executing states which makes it very difficult for lawyers to make requests for alternatives when they cannot cooperate with the lawyer in the other country. And then we've also have the major gap in the system in the EU legal framework, which is that we have no common standards on detention and in particular on pretrial detention. And then our, the fourth and last finding that I want to highlight before kicking off the discussion is that the EU um, and domestic but legal and institutional frameworks are simply too complex. Each alternative is governed by a different EU legislative instrument, and each instrument has its own sets of conditions. And then, as the EU mutual recognition instruments need to be transposed, each member state has adopted its own implemented instruments, leading to wide variations amongst EU member states. So, for instance, the competent authorities involved in the application of each instrument will differ from one country to another and includes a, a very wide variety of actors, from police officers to prosecutors to investigating judges, sentencing courts, probation services, prison authorities, as well as representatives from the ministries of justice and interior sometimes. Um, so we've tried to show this in our report um, and it's resulted in a massively big annex to try to identify and map out this very complex institutional framework in the different countries that we um, surveyed. Um, so what does this all mean? Well, it means that the security objective in the EU criminal justice policy has prevailed and with it detention. So what we are seeing at a domestic level, where prison is seen as the go-to measure, is reflected at cross-border level. And this is despite our overcrowded prisons, like Ilza pointed out. It's despite the many ECHR rulings against EU member states for failure to meet the most basic human right to uh, be protected from inhumane and degrading treatment. And it's even despite the COVID crisis, where placing someone in detention places them at a heightened risk to their health and to their life. And we see detention figures rising again in France. Just yesterday, I saw figures from Poland. Um, by the, at the end of 2020, the number of persons in pretrial detention had hit an all-time high since 2010. So we're faced once again in our research with this uncomfortable truth that the key challenge is to tackle um, detention culture, both at cross-border and domestic levels, more than trying to promote alternatives because they simply will not be used as long as it's so easy to use an EAW and so easy to place someone in detention. And it's difficult. It's difficult. How do you reconcile the need for cross-border cooperation and yet try to make it more difficult to use and to rely on an EAW and to go for detention? And for fair trials, our key question is how can we promote cross-border cooperation in a more humane way? How do we engage other stakeholders in this cooperation between authorities? How do we engage lawyers, probation services, prison services in this dialogue? And how do we promote alternative measures without creating what criminologists call a net widening effect? That is where alternatives will be used instead of release rather than instead of detention at which we see at a domestic level. In Belgium, for instance, where we have um, electronic bracelet as a, an alternative, we've seen a massive rise in the use of this instrument and yet no corresponding decrease in detention rates. Quite the contrary, in fact. And we've put together a series of recommendations, but we need these discussions. We need to think together. We need to commit and engage on tackling detention as part of our reflection on cross-border cooperation. 
And we need this dialogue because we need so many different actors to be involved and participate in this paradigm shift to move us away from detention. So that's why we're very, very pleased to see, to welcome you today and to see the interest of so many people um, and to share insights and perspectives on these key questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, and just a little bit of, of housekeeping before, uh, before we kick off our, our, our first session. So I will um, just run through the agenda today. So session one that is, that is starting shortly uh, will be dedicated to the resistance towards alternatives to EAW for the prosecution. And it will focus on the obstacles uh, to the use of European supervision order and the European investigation order as alternative instruments to EAW and as also as alternative to pretrial detention. So uh, the, the discussion will revolve around why states are reluctant to implement these instruments and why are they still largely unknown and unused by the practitioners. Um, after the first panel, which will end at 3.30 um, uh, Central European time, um, there will be a break of 15 minutes and to log into the second panel you will need um, a new link which you have received in the email uh, from Zoom. But I will also, before the end of the uh, first panel, I will also uh, uh, copy it into the chat so that it's easier for you to access. Then um, copy that uh, link that I copy in the chat and, and use it for, for joining the, the second panel if that's easier for you. And then at 3.45, we'll have the session two, which will be more focused on the EU action and the need for EU action on pretrial detention on discrimination and procedural safeguards. And this session will address uh, one of the main obstacles to the use of alternative instruments on, on, in cross-border uh, proceedings. And that is the pretrial, um, the over-reliance on detention in cross-border proceedings and overuse of pretrial detention for non-nationals and non-residents. Um, so without further ado, um, I will give the floor to um, Cecilia, who will be moderating um, the, the first panel. Cecilia is a visiting professor of EU law in the University of San Louis, Bruxelles and the uh, Free University of, of Brussels and a postdoctoral research fellow at the Belgian National Fund of Scientific Research. She's specializing in the protection of fundamental rights in the European Union, and she completed last year a PhD thesis on the principle of mutual trust in uh, EU law. Uh, thank you very much, Celia, and um, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ilse, for the introduction and hello to everyone. So we will start this first panel and as underlined, our panelists will focus on the obstacles to the use of the European supervision order and the European investigation orders as alternative instruments to European arrest warrants and pre-trial detention. So we will start this discussion with uh, Lucas Tari, who is a chair of the Eurojust board that is competent for external relations. And beforehand, Mrs. Mr. Sorry, Stari was a prosecutor in the International Department of the Supreme Public Prosecutor's Office of the Czech Republic. So the role of Eurojust appears uh, to be crucial for supporting criminal cooperation between the member states. The research we conducted in the different countries indeed showed that uh, it ensures the existence of a network between national authorities, which in turn facilitates cooperation between the different national stakeholders. It would therefore be very interesting to ask you, Mr. Stari, if Eurojust also supports national authorities in concrete cases to use alternative measures to the European arrest warrant, and what are the main challenges faced by national authorities in this framework? Could you also share us maybe any promising practices in, in that regard or ways of improvement? The floor is yours, Mr. Stari. Uh, thank you for the floor, Cecilia, if I may. Thank you, uh, the Fair Trial, for having invited Eurojust. Uh, for me personally uh, and for Eurojust, it's always a pleasure to contribute to such forum where uh, 
people from wider public society and legal society can meet and exchange their views on the particular issues as is the case today. And I hope this will be the case after, after my intervention today. Uh, before addressing specifically the question raised, allow me to say a few words about Eurojust. This is the EU agency with almost 20 years uh, experience and history, uh, which was set up to, as it was said, strengthen and support collaboration in serious cross-border investigations and prosecutions. I'm underlying the word serious. Indeed, the majority, the vast majority of cases facilitated upon the request of competent judicial law enforcement authorities of EU member states indeed concern very serious crimes, murders, organized criminality, terrorism, serious financial crime, mafia type crimes, and I could continue. Uh, second important element is that the focus of Eurojust work is in the pretrial investigation and prosecution. Uh, we do support also our partners uh, during the trial sessions and after trial, however, in a much, much lim more limited way. So I'm um, emphasizing those points really to explain the perspective which I'm looking uh, at the problematic discussed today. Uh, as such, uh, in the introductory opening uh, remarks, a uh, few um, questions were raised, namely that uh, European investigation order and European supervision order are not sufficiently used as alternatives to the EU, uh, EU European arrest warrant, uh, that uh, the practitioners are perhaps reluctant to use those alternatives, and that maybe there is overuse in uh, issuing European arrest warrants. Well, <clears throat> here I'm mm, honestly must say that I'm not fully sharing that, that opinion. First, uh, I have never looked at the European investigation order, to be very frank, as an alternative to the European arrest warrant. The aim of the European investigation order is a bit different in my view, and namely this is to collect evidence. Uh, what has one bear in mind is also the fact that European investigation order, despite it's a relatively new instrument, but in merit, it does not bring so much new in comparison to the previously existing convention, council conventions just to name uh, the second additional protocol to 59 convention and 2000 EU treaty. Both of them actually foreseen the possibility uh, to interview suspect using video conferencing in this or less in the same way as uh, the e European investigation order directive does. But the aim of the European arrest warrant is different. And as it was said in the, in the beginning, the reasons are multifold to prevent suspects for continuing in their criminal activity, to prevent uh, them running away, and also to prevent potential influencing of witnesses or jeopardizing investigation by the suspects. Those elements um, need to be proved. They, in my view, it's not sufficient just to generally state and refer to those uh, legally foreseen conditions, but in each and every case, when the court is issuing European investigation order or vice versa, executing such uh, European, uh, pardon, uh, arrest warrant, those elements need to be proved and evidenced. And again, uh, from the perspective of Eurojust, when we speak about serious crimes, those are really 
perpetrators and suspects who we are dealing with uh, that really pose a public threat to the white public. It's, and maybe I'm already now referring to one of the elements why European supervision order is not used that much. At least that's what we for us, uh, see in our casework. And to give you some figures, last year Eurojust uh, facilitated more than 4,000 new cases, newly registered cases upon the request of EU member states authorities. Uh, almost 1,800 of them were about the facilitation and supporting execution of European investigation orders. Nearly 600 of them concerned execution of European arrest warrants. But in all our statistics last year, I couldn't find but one simple case when Eurojust was requested or dealt with execution of European supervision order. Uh, we, uh, I, I did some preparation prior my today's intervention. And I would say that in entire history of Eurojust, we didn't have more than, definitely not more than 10 cases concerning European supervision order. Uh, so the reasons why the supervision order is not used are definitely multifold. From the Eurojust perspective, definitely this instrument is not suitable to meet its objective when we speak especially about serious crime and when looking at the possibilities offered by this tool uh, i don't think it's simply meeting the requirements of the practitioners uh, <clears throat> uh, what i could say about um, another other um, a few words more about the European arrest warrant. Uh, our statistics also doesn't prove that the issue of over um, of, of lacking proportionality when issuing European arrest warrants would be indeed an issue. Only only a really limited number um, of Eurojust cases concern this this particular question what our casework shows that the issue of proportional proportionality when speaking about um, issuing of european arrest warrants have been widely considered by the by the practitioners so contrary to basically in contrary what has been said in the beginning I need to say that this is the issue of proportionality have been more and more taken into consideration by, by practitioners. Uh, in that respect, I can refer to some uh, documents uh, prepared by Eurojust, uh, which are accessible on Eurojust webpage. Uh, perhaps just you know, some of them to mention you're just guidance uh, guidelines for deciding on competing requests for surrender and extradition or when it comes to the application of european investigation orders a very recent report on Eurojust casework in the field of european investigation order well a um, few more points uh, to uh, to mention what are the alternatives to the uh, European arrest warrant? Question, are there any? If we especially speak about uh, investigation into serious crimes. In my view, the current um, European supervision order, as I already said, doesn't offer us those alternatives. As a potential alternative, one may think of a transfer of entire criminal proceedings in a case that indeed uh, the suspect uh, left the country and uh, the authority which initiated the criminal investigation might consider to transfer the case to the country where the suspect lives. However, here I would be indeed very, very cautious. 
as the practice shows that the prosecution is conducted in the most efficient way, most especially in the countries where the crime was committed. And one should not neglect the justified uh, interest of victims uh, and other circumstances. The evidence is mostly in the country where the crime was uh, committed. Uh, one also has to take into account practical elements, which arises when one considers to transfer the case into abroad, starting with translation of the entire criminal file and many, many others. Uh, so really the practice shows that the efficiency of the criminal investigations, one being transferred abroad, is much, much lower. And to uh, maybe justify use of European arrest warrant, this is exactly a tool which enables or which somehow prevents this, un this lacking efficiency and which helped a lot to, and now I will be speaking about the middle European uh, experience, especially uh, as several relatively small countries are located in the middle Europe and the practice of the transfer of criminal cases has been in the past widely used. And thanks to the European arrest warrant, also thanks to it, the number of those transferred cases has decreased and which contributed and increased the efficiency of entire criminal investigation. Uh, to conclude, uh, it's indeed important to take deeply into consideration all those remarks you, which have been addressed. Proportionality, uh, human dignity of the accused suspects, and uh, simply the protection of human rights. Absolutely no question about it. At the same time, one should not neglect the aim to avoid impunity. And at a certain point, uh, we simply have to make choices. Either we want this or that. Certain balance needs to be naturally present, but one should not forget that simply if one wants to have, wants to avoid impunity, must choose also measures which indeed are sometimes very intrusive. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and I'm uh, naturally available to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your insights, Lucas. It was very interesting and in particular, the, um, the insistence on the weaknesses uh, of the European supervision order and of the alternatives. Uh, to the EAW, I think it's uh, it's interesting for, for us to have this point of view of the of Eurojust. And now we will give the floor to uh, James McGill, who is the first vice president of the Council uh, of Bars and Law Societies of Europe, which represents lawyers across Europe, and managing partner of a law firm in Ireland specializing in criminal law. His practice includes uh, domestic and international cases, both within and outside the European Union. So we know that Ireland has opted out from the European investigation order system and has only very recently implemented the European supervision order, uh, such as uh, underlined by uh, law. And we would therefore like to ask you how you explain the reticence of Ireland towards these instruments. And also uh, in the light of your experience, uh, Mr. McGrill, how do you think that the lack of availability of alternative instruments affects or not the rights of suspects? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Cecilia, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes, 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 sorry. <clears throat> To explain the very unusual nature of Ireland's relationship with the European Union measures requires in large measure to look at our relationship with the United Kingdom, with whom we have been fighting for 800 years, 
but with whom we share a common legal tradition. And many of the Irish opt-outs were precisely because the UK had already decided to opt out of the same measures previously. And we are intrigued to see whether as a member we will mature and grow up now that the United Kingdom are not part of the decision-making process and whether we will evaluate measures based on their merit rather than on what the United Kingdom would do. And when we look at the criminal law field, it's entirely predictable that Ireland would opt into measures that were of assistance to the authorities, like the arrest warrant. And it was a little bit more surprising that under a particular minister, we opted into the a interpretation and information directives, but then we didn't opt into the right of access to a lawyer or the presumption of innocence. So it, it, it's a very patchy type approach. If I was feeling defensive of my country, which I sort of am this week because we were beaten by the French so badly at the weekend, eh, I would say that the reason the investigation order is not a priority here is that we will not surrender anyone for trial we will not surrender anyone on the warrant for investigation. We will only surrender them for trial. So you could justify us not being part of the investigation order framework because we wouldn't see it as part of our approach to things. It's not an especially convincing argument, but it, it is one possible explanation. Uh, Lucas was mentioning the proportionality uh, issue, and that is going to become a real headache for our courts now given that the United Kingdom have the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, um, which includes now in the arrest warrant section a proportionality test. Now that was being informally applied in the UK courts. We haven't been applying it in the Irish courts, but an Irish judge is going to find it extremely uncomfortable to surrender somebody to Poland for a crime they wouldn't surrender them to the United Kingdom for. So that, 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 that is going to cause a real tension and we all know that um, the parliamentarians in their most recent assessment of the warrant have looked at the proportionality issue. And the problem is that the commission know that if they reopen the uh, framework decision, everyone will want something different and they'll never get agreement again. So if I can just explain to you where we are in Ireland in terms of the measures that we have signed up to, principally the supervision order and the, um, the, 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 the mutual recognition of sentences. We have only recently uh, introduced into our national law the supervision order. It was in a piece of part legislation last year. The legislation was only commenced with effect from the 5th of February of this year. And the mutual recognition measure is not yet part of our national law, but it is in what's called pre-legislative scrutiny. So it's before the Parliament and it's not yet on the floor of the Parliament, it's being, you know, a, a preliminary a vetting exercise, but it would be expected that it would become part of our national law within this year. And the context behind that is that because Ireland had failed to implement international law, these measures, Irish citizens sought for surrender abroad were potentially at a significant disadvantage compared to nationals of other countries. And because we have a client whose surrender is sought to the Republic of Lithuania, eh, we made inquiries about this and inquired from the eh, Commission as to whether they were contemplating infringement proceedings against Ireland because these measures were so long outstanding. And we were refused that permission. And oddly, it was suggested that there was no file even in existence considering infringement. Now we knew that not to be correct because Commissioner Eurova wrote to a number of Irish MEPs and others, pointing out that the commission had been in contact with Ireland in respect of non-implementation. So again, I, I, I'm sure colleagues have, have tried this before. We then applied under the basis of open information to the commission for their file, and we were refused on the basis of the general um, presumption of confidentiality attaching to communications between the Commission and the state. And we appealed that refusal to the General Court, where we won 
on a very narrow ground that the first refusal hadn't itemized the documents and therefore the second refusal had put us at a disadvantage that we weren't able to argue against the presumed confidentiality because we hadn't been told the nature of the documents that they were asserting this over. So we, we've got our documents uh, and we then brought proceedings here before the Irish National Courts to sue for the non-transposition uh, as a measure in Irish law. Sorry. Now, by the time our proceedings came on for hearing, the supervision order had been transposed. So that has sort of dropped out of the, the picture somewhat. But the uh, mutual recognition of judgments is still live because it hasn't been transposed. And that case has been heard by a judge of the High Court who has asked for some further information. And basically, it is going to reduce itself down to whether such a failure is justiciable at the request of an individual or whether the only person entitled to make a complaint against Ireland is the Commission within the context of infringement proceedings. And we would be hopeful uh, that the court would say this is of such potential significance in a whole range of other areas that an article 267 reference would be preferable to an Irish judgment appeal to another Irish court. So that is, it. it's, a, it's a live thing the judge is considering his position presently. So what I can say to you in terms of um, the, 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 the safeguards um, in arrest warrant cases and the alternatives is it defies logic. Our position is inherently uh, contradictory that we have selected some but not all of measures that are intended to be part of a package. Some of the reasons for that selectivity is simply self-serving by the state. They don't want to incur the cost that might be involved in you know, the, the engaging in supervision. Um, as I say, it's only since the 5th of February that that has been part of our law. We haven't yet had to look at a case where we would be asking uh, our national uh, authorities to request another state to, to deal with supervision. But that's bound to happen very soon. Uh, on a practitioner level, uh, I think that things have changed so much for us all in the last 12 months in terms of the understanding of the dangers of travel when it's unnecessary. Uh, the alternatives to detention, because you can't be putting people uh, at the risk of their health. It's entirely inconsistent with the presumption of innocence that people will be put in these places where they can't protect themselves. I think we've all learned to be more comfortable with technology. Uh, in many, many arrest warrant cases, we know, and, and Vanya has done great work in this over the years with the European Criminal Bar Association, uh, where a person has adequate means, and they are professionally represented in both relevant jurisdictions. A great number of arrest warrants are never actually followed through because the matter might be capable of administrative resolution or of voluntary travel for the purpose of trial or to participate in an investigation. And now that we have relatively recently in most member states got dual representation publicly funded, I think there is a real potential that we can look more imaginatively at how we implement the warrant and look at how the role of uh, lawyers can assist this. I mean, again, a very frustrating part of domestic practice here in Ireland is that when we have a client in custody, which is not the norm, the presumption here is for provision and release, but some uh, nationals of other member states, for their own reasons, anticipating a sentence upon surrender will not apply for provision and release here because Irish prison conditions, bad though they are in some respects, are markedly better than in some member states and people prefer to run down the clock in an Irish prison. But where, you, where the person doesn't want to be in custody, a huge frustration is the delay in following up the request for additional information. So at the moment, that's a written procedure and it's to and back and, you know, if the, the court asks for information from the requesting state and we get an answer and we don't understand the answer, then we have to go and talk to another lawyer representing the interests of the client in the requesting state. 
wouldn't it be fabulous if lawyers participated in real time? You know, if the, the request is from Lithuania, why shouldn't the Lithuanian government have their lawyer virtually present in the Irish courtroom so that when the question is asked, it is answered there and then, and we engage in the ordinary form of legal debate that we do every single day, and we take out of it this wasteful delay. So again, I think they're the sort of things that we will be looking at now, uh, independent of black letter law, simply as a matter of how do we use the, 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 the resources that are available. So if I haven't done my country down too badly by this point, I'll uh, finish here. Thank you, James, uh, for this very interesting talk and talk and uh, uh, the, on the particular context of Ireland, uh, which will also be impacted by Brexit, uh, we suppose, as you underlined, and also on the importance of the role of lawyers in the framework of the EAW. We also observe that in our research. And we will, we will now listen to Fabrizia Bemer, who is a public prosecutor in Italy, special, specializing among others uh, in the practice of the European investigation order. So we know that the European investigation order offers an avenue for limiting disproportionate uh, European arrest warrants issued for prosecution. Um, but we have observed when researching in the different countries that national authorities uh, were reluctant uh, to use this uh, instrument, notably because they prefer to interrogate people uh, physically uh, um, and not by video conference. And uh, for a few years now, uh, this e, uh, e, uh, EIO sorry, uh, exists and it is not used as much as it could be. And uh, in the light of your experience as a prosecutor and as an expert of these instruments, could you give us some practical perspective on the use of uh, the European investigation order as an alternative uh, to the EAW? Uh, in the context of investigations and how do you think that the use of this instrument can be promoted amongst uh, national authorities? You have to turn on your mic. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, good. So first of all, I don't know, I think you should see my screen, I hope. Yes, we are seeing it, Fabrizia. But I don't see mine. Perfect. <laughs> open your PowerPoint, I think. Or... Yeah, I don't know what's, what's happening. So, uh, in the meantime, we can speak. Uh, resume, sure. I don't know what's happening. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's, um, I've heard uh, Lucas and I have heard uh, James. They have um, spoken of very interesting points and some points, well, in some points I agree, in some points I do not. And then a uh, specification, just to explain a little explanation. I work in the public prosecutor's office. I'm not the public prosecutor of Florence, so just to, to explain, but I work every day with many European investigation holders and uh, regulatory letters. European investigation holders, um, Lucas was saying that it is not um, an alternative and using the word alternative, it's tricky, in fact, is right. I share the same uh, opinion. Do you see the screen? I don't, I don't think you see because I don't see it. I see your screen, but not the PowerPoint. Mm. Let's uh, see. If you, if you like, I can share the presentation and then you can just tell me when to move from slide to slide. Otherwise, you have to choose. The, I'll try, uh, yes. Otherwise, you can do it for me. It's, uh, Yes, so you have to stop sharing your screen and I will do that. Yeah, I think so. I think it's better. Let me see. Where is it? Uh, just click the green share screen and unshare. Yes. Or stop at stop at the... At the, at the You're screen. sharing screen, yes. Stop share. Yeah, exactly. Here it is. Yeah, thank you very much. 
So first of all, we are speaking about three directives, which is the first slide. Yes, exactly. The first slide, we are speaking of three directives. Yeah, this one, thank you. And they are, if you look at the time, we are speaking of framework decision of 2002, 2009, and we reach 2014, which is the directive on the European investigation order. I will not speak actually of the European supervision order because as uh, Lucas was saying, um, actually, I mean, for Italy, speaking for Italy, but in general, I don't know much about uh, the European supervision order because it is not used. And why? Mm, because there are certain uh, guarantees which can be found in the, in the country legislation. So we can apply those, uh, let's say, guarantees uh, uh, if uh, a person, for instance, is in prison and the lawyer asks for some, I don't know, uh, to stay at home or just to come twice a day, I don't know, once a day, to, to put a signature in front of uh, some police. So there are some, uh, let's say, guarantees uh, which do not uh, need uh, actually the European supervision order. In fact, also in Italy, it is not used so much. That's true. I was, I was saying that I will speak about uh, the directive of the European supervision order. First of all, of all the people who are now, uh, here in, uh, in this uh, conference, how many people have applied the European, uh, the European uh, order instead of applying the European arrest warrant? This I would like to know. Uh, Ilse, do you have the poll perhaps, if it's possible? Yes, I will stop sharing screen and, and share the poll then. Yes. Yes, the first one. So I would like uh, people just to give their opinion because this is important uh, to understand uh, what is the relation between the European investigation order and the European arrest warrant? As I have said, the tricky, let's say, word is the word alternative, because it can be used, but it is not an alternative. And I'll explain, I'll come to it, I'll explain what does it mean. It's a, it says that host and panelists cannot vote. Yes, exactly. Okay, perfect. So if they have, uh, we can close and just give a look, just to give uh, an idea <laughs> and to have an idea also for me. Okay, there are some people still answering, so I will give five yeah? seconds for yeah? everyone who sure. wants to uh, give for their sure. sense. <laughs> I've been too quick. <laughs> and Three, two, one, I'm sharing the results. Hmm. So we have four who have voted yes and 21 who have voted no. No, and I met, this is what uh, I expected actually and why. You can close it, thank you. And why? I'll tell you why. Uh, the, the slide the third, so the, the following one. As Lucas was saying, uh, it is not an alternative. It is uh, a request. It is uh, why uh, the European investigation order, it's a form, it's Annex A of the directive, and it's made of uh, 17 pages. These 17 pages go from section A to section L. Section C, as you see, you have investigative measures. So 
This means that it is to look for an evidence. Do not forget that the European investigation order, the magic word of the European investigation orders is evidence. It is done to look for evidence. So this is the first point. It, is, uh, it says obtaining information or evidence which is already in the possession of the executing authority. We have hearing, we have suspected or accused person. So it is a, a temporary transfer of, of person held in custody. We have, may, we have different uh, possibilities. But what's important here is that we can use the hearing, for instance, for a person in custody but because we have to ask for that person for, let's say, evidences. We have to ask other things that haven't been asked in the first, for instance, uh, hearing. Instead of bringing this person, I don't know, from, uh, let's say, from Italy to, I don't know, France, Germany, or whatever you want, so to another state, instead of issuing an European arrest warrant, you can ask for this. And this is also an important thing which can be used. In this sense, it is the alternative, but it is in view, not of the person, but of the evidence. This is important. Next slide. We have here section age, so we have transfer of a person held in custody, we have the requirements, and in fact, section H2, video or telephone conference. In Italy, uh, I don't know the other countries, well, uh, I've spoken with other colleagues, and um, the same is also in other countries, but it is not so bad as in Italy, because if you want to have a hearing of a person, for instance, in custody, it is a problem, because you have to ask for the, the judge of preliminary investigation, which is called GIP in Italy, then the GIP has to, has to do the video conference in presence of the public prosecutor. Then uh, it must be given uh, some authorizations to the police who held in custody this person. So it is rather complicated and the net also. So, it goes uh, through um, a, cert, uh, a center, which is DAP, which is in Rome. So we have to contact, to come in contact with Rome each time. So you see, even if it is a good measure, then when you apply it, it is not so easy. It is not so easy. The next one, please. This is what I was saying. So. The article 24, it says you can have as alternative to avoid to transfer the defendant in custody to another country and execute it. But the focal point is that you cannot use it for the person, so to avoid the defendant to be surrendered, but it is only uh, it's a kind of, um, it's the evidence that we are looking for and it's the evidence which is linked to that person. So it is um, a different point of view. It is an alternative in the sense of the evidence. This is, uh, I'm striking a lot because um, otherwise, I mean, uh, the, the, the weight is made in, uh, in the wrong direction, let's say. The next, please. This is what we have said, the next one. Uh, here is also another problem, which is linked uh, just to, we could have skipped it, but just to, to explain it, that in Italy, the European arrest warrants are, um, go, to the uh, general public prosecutor. And there is a register, but it is not so, um, it, it's not shared with the public prosecutor, the district public prosecutor. 
So it is also uh, important to see these differences because in this case, the European investigation order is uh, from the public prosecutor, district public prosecutor. The European arrest warrant is from the general public prosecutor. So European investigation order district and European arrest warrant general public prosecutor. This is also another uh, question which is also important and which is also to consider when it's, we speak of it. So it generates a lot of, uh, lot of confusion, but uh, the, um, it is not so smooth. Hmm? Then we have the problems of translations. The problem of translations, uh, we don't have uh, translators in the, or few translators in the general public prosecutor's office. We have them in the district office, but it's not a public register. It's a register which, uh, which has been made uh, by knowing people uh, from many years. They are very good. They are professional, but it's not, it's not general. So also this is another problem. Next slide. Possible solutions. I have uh, uh, given here, uh, I have put here this, um, this address, uh, the eCodex EU project. This is an important project uh, to which I have participated. And I have seen that, for instance, if you put in this secure structure, uh, the European investigation order, which will be in, um, in the next future, because uh, some of them, uh, some of the member states have already implemented it. So if you put in it also the European arrest warrant, uh, this could in some cases help because it is in a secure structure. Because sometimes if you are arrest warrant needs also some explanation needs some contact, for instance, through Eurojust. I have worked many times with Eurojust, but sometimes you can even uh, speak from one judge, from one, let's say, from one member state to another, from one court to another. And it goes through internet, through normal internet. So this is not 100% uh, uh, secure. Why this uh, infrastructure could be uh, very secure. Um, it's uh, the second, uh, please. No, the other one. No, 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 the poll. The second poll, the second uh, question. Sorry, um, I, I think I launched them together, but we can, we can do it again, okay. the yeah. second one. Yeah, for sure. So you can answer the second one. And then, I want to leave you uh, with uh, among the many cases that I've had uh, and with a case which is uh, very, it's a very strange case. And this is just for your reflection because we are speaking of European arrest warrants, we are speaking of, uh, uh, of the order and we have something which, which goes, uh, let's say outside. So let's wait uh, for the second. Are still some yes, to vote? Those. There are still votes coming in. Let's, let's I see. Yeah. <laughs> they have they have to think carefully about it. <laughs> so um, in the meantime, um, I can speak about this uh, recent case uh, we received. It's a uh, it's out of the European investigation order because they sent an European investigation order, and we don't know why, but they retried it. Uh, it is uh, from um, from a country from a Mr. from an Easter country, and uh, we received uh, instead a rogatory letter. So, and they said that this person. So yeah, okay, perfect. So if you have time, 
just give a look uh, to the to the um, mail ad uh, to the address that I have put, uh, and perhaps you can uh, copy it in the in the slide. So I was saying that uh, it was uh, just asked uh, it, that there was uh, a trial and this person should be transferred, or otherwise uh, this person could receive it in um, in custody. We uh, sent uh, the, um, the papers to the, to the prison and uh, he said that he wanted, uh, he didn't want to be present, he said that he wanted to be tried in absentia. Then the court wrote us back and they said we cannot accept this paper because he had to say if he wanted or if he didn't want. He cannot say he wants to be tried in absentia. We said, why not? I mean, it's, it's normal because he has written it. He wrote it in Italian for Italy and wrote it in his own language. So it was clearly understandable. Um, there is no answer for the moment because we sent it we said that for us formally it was correct they haven't replied we know that uh, the date has passed and they haven't written anything but this was a strange a very strange case never seen that before uh, i received between 10 and 20 european investigation orders per day so it is very strange this is very strange and um, just for the discussion, uh, for you, for the discussion. So the last slide, slide, I thank you very much. I'm here if you have any question, or if you want to something else, I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabrizia, for your talk. It was really interesting, uh, especially when you specify the link between uh, the European Arrest Warrant and the European Investigation Order. And thank you also for sharing your recent experience. I think it was really useful for all the participants. And now we will give the floor to Vania Costa Ramos, who is a partner in a criminal law firm based in Lisbon and vice chair uh, of the European Criminal Bar Association. Vania is also member of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and the Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment in respect of Portugal and a very active member of the Fair Trials Network, the legal uh, experts advisory panel. Uh, so being specialized in European criminal cases, we would like to ask you Vania uh, to share with us practical insights on the role of the law in challenging the proportionality of the use uh, of European arrest warrants and detention, and in particular the importance um, of access to legal assistance in both the uh, issuing and the executing member states. It was already uh, mentioned in a uh, previous present uh, presentation, so the, the access to um, legal assistance is very important uh, in order to challenge, surrender and seek alternative measures uh, within the framework of European arrest warrants. And um, we know that the control of proportionality is uh, very crucial in the framework of the European arrest warrant. It was notably recalled by the European Court of Justice in its recent judgments uh, concerning the requirements of independence of issuing uh, authorities. Um, moreover, we would like to ask you if you think that the re recent experience of the COVID-19 related restrictions in terms of movement and the European Commission's digitalization communication of December 2020 offer opportunities to promote, promote alternatives to the EAW? That's a lot of questions. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to speak to you about this topic, which is very dear to me. Uh, from my practice and also uh, studies. Um, I would just like to, to share some, some views and also to, to react to some of the points that have been made during the, the previous speeches. 
um, so to try to adapt what I was going to say to, to what has been said already. So uh, uh, firstly, I, I, I mean, I, I agree that, uh, of course, uh, uh, theoretically speaking, the European arrest warrant is a, a measure, as, as Lucas stated, uh, to uh, put people in pretrial detention because there is a flight risk, a risk of, uh, of uh, continuing uh, with criminal activities or of tampering with evidence, you know, like danger for the, the victim, the witnesses. This is the common theoretical framework. Uh, um, also, uh, of course, the EAW was created for serious cross-border crime. So the idea was, of course, uh, you know, like if it's for a terrorist cases, mafia, you know, like the, these type of cases, big uh, drugs networks, uh, trafficking in human beings. I mean, these, these are serious cases and uh, not always, but many times they have certain risks uh, uh, that might require uh, the imposing of pretrial detention in, in those given cases. However, I think there is some very interesting uh, number that Lucas gave us. So Lucas, Lucas uh, told us that um, in his uh, research um, the last year, so uh, Eurojust had, uh, if I, if I uh, got it well, opened 4,000 new cases and 600 of them concerned EAW. So uh, I, I just gave a quick look to the statistics of EAWs. The, uh, the, the last ones available are from 2018 and they show a total number of 17,471 EAW is issued. So <laughs> this means that the, the, the 600 or, well, it can, it can uh, change, of course, uh, uh, during the years, but even if it would be 2,000 or 3,000 dealt with by Eurojust, this is not the majority, uh, which is understandable. I mean, Eurojust is, is, uh, is concerned with serious cross-border crimes, uh, 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 criminality that is by nature cross-border, but uh, uh, as we can see, there are another uh, 17,000 or 15,000, it doesn't matter, EAWs issued. So, and from my practice, um, I can say that most of the cases, and I did not have 17,000 cases or 600 or, or, or even, of, of course, much less than that. But from my practice, most of the cases I've been facing are not cases where Eurojust would be uh, uh, intervening. I have one case uh, maybe where, where that would be the case uh, for, for a fraud, a, a, a large scale fraud. But otherwise, uh, these are much, much uh, 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 less serious cases. And I think that that is where, where the issue uh, needs to be uh, touched upon because I also agree completely that uh, typically, so EAW should be for this uh, pretrial detention to avoid the risks that uh, the person would cause if, if remaining in freedom. But there is also, you know, to get evidence uh, and to impose pretrial detention, you also need to interview the accused person. So there is normally, and at least in my jurisdiction, maybe also in others, so you, you, you there is also a kind of a symbiosis between also wanting to interview the accused person and deciding uh, or changing a decision on, on whether to impose a pretrial detention. And of course, in the domestic level, this, this works quite easily because, uh, um, I mean, if you're located in Portugal and the uh, public prosecutor uh, or the judge uh, orders an arrest and the person is brought to the presence of, of the judge within 48 hours, there will be immediately an interview and then the judge will decide, well, uh, you should remain in pretrial detention because these risks are, are applying or you will be given bail, you know, with, with, with uh, uh, almost no conditions, just like stating your address and name or with certain uh, um, added conditions. And, and the problem is that when we, we put this in the cross-border uh, scenario, this doesn't happen anymore. So, so the person is not brought before the judge within 48 hours. Well, they might be brought before the judge in the executing state, but this judge will not decide whether, whether the person will get bail in the issuing state. <laughs> so, you know, uh, uh, so, so this is not happening as quick. And so I can just give a few examples from, from my practice that show how often uh, 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 an EAW would have not been needed <laughs> or was removed after the defense could act and explain the situation of, of the person. 
And sadly, uh, as James has, uh, has outlined, this is not possible if you do not have quick access to lawyers in the issuing state. Because, uh, for example, I, I can give you, uh, um, there is a standing uh, case law in Portugal from the Supreme Court stating that uh, our court is not supposed to check proportionality of the uh, uh, European arrest warrant because that's a matter for the issuing state. So I have argued that in, in the executing state in some cases to show that actually uh, what was being sought was the interview of the client, you know, like for him to be sent over, interviewed, and then quite likely released after that. Uh, or that uh, he was being sought to be served with documents, to be served with a summons to attend trial, something like this, or, 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 or with an indictment. And in practice, uh, just to, to, to give two, two very uh, uh, clear examples. So one case I had was, uh, uh, I, I, have, I speak German, so I'm not, I will mention Germany just because it, uh, it happens that I speak German. So I, I have uh, uh, some cases with Germany. Uh, a guy was arrested, he lives in Portugal since 2015. He is arrested on an European arrest warrant for drugs trafficking. But what, what was the offense? The offense was that uh, some time ago he had been caught in uh, Berlin in his flat with eight cannabis plants. Eight. So uh, in Portugal, uh, he would not be in jail for this <laughs> normally, you know, like in pre-trial detention. Uh, at least not in the case we had. Uh, I mean, we had people with much more than eight plants. So uh, uh, this guy uh, was arrested, uh, uh, the family contacted us, we tried to, so he, he consented to his surrender because he, he, he didn't have uh, uh, money to fight the case and he thought that he wouldn't be in jail in Germany at all <laughs> if he were there. Uh, so he, he was still in jail about 15 days until he was surrendered and then finally brought to a judge. I contacted the lawyer in the issuing state, he was very uh, shocked. He tried to, to argue in Germany to have the, the European re uh, rest warrant removed, but it was not possible to do it so quickly. So he was surrendered because he consented. The day he arrived, the day after he was brought before the German judge, who then released him on bail under the payment of 1,000 euros. The trial had not even been scheduled. So basically, uh, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, then he came back to Portugal, of course, after he was released, so, because he lived here, he was a, a resident. Uh, then he, he got a, a suspended sentence later on, so it was not, it was not a serious case. Uh, I, ha I have other similar cases, uh, even cases where uh, on their face you might think, okay, it's a robbery, an attempted robbery, so theoretically speaking, it's a, it's a serious case, but then you, you look at the facts, and you look at the, the age, of the accused person and the lack of prior uh, uh, records, and and it becomes clear that this person is not very likely to 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 land in in jail, or uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, I just had a case like this. The the lawyer was contacted in the issuing state, and he also managed to have the judge remove the European arrest warrant and impose a, a financial bail. In this case, a bit higher, like five thousand euros. And then later on, a trial was conducted. The trial was also not scheduled at the time the EAW had been issued and at the time of arrest. And also the, the guy got a suspended sentence again. <laughs> so, and he was never in pretrial detention. I, I can go on with these cases. I mean, even in, in the, uh, 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 I had a guy arrested in Belgium on a Spanish EAW by the Audiencia Nacional, a very important court, as we all know, for a serious case of drugs trafficking. Uh, he was given bail and he drove to Spain to go, you know, to the court to, to present himself. Uh, when he got there, uh, the, the prosecutor told him that there, there, he had no time for the interview, so he should come back in two weeks. Uh, in the end, the interview was done uh, uh, some time later uh, uh, and he also got bail. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you... Uh, 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 at least like 10 stories like this. And so th this shows that in such cases, uh, either, in my view, of course, uh, uh, there could have been other measures, EIOs, or sometimes just rogatory letters to summon a person, uh, or an EIO to conduct an interview by video link often, 
And then if needed, a supervision order to, to impose some restrictive measures that is not pretrial detention. I think, and I agree with you, uh, with, with uh, Fabricia and with uh, uh, Lucas, that yes, uh, ESO is quite complicated. So that's why many times it will end up with some financial bail because this is much easier. <laughs> so, the, you know, uh, if persons can pay something, you know, the judge in the issuing state, uh, it's much easier. So they just pay uh, some amount, the family will pay or someone you know, to, to the to the state, to the, to the courts. And so you don't need the cooperation of the executing state to control whether the person will, will abide by the obligation to show up at trial later on. So, and I, I should say that financial bail is often a very good incentive for people to, to attend their trial because they don't want to lose that money. So it's, it's a, a good measure. So I, I think in these cases, the, the question is, uh, why are the authorities not, not you know, like uh, using this reasoning? Uh, do I really need an EAW? Or, you know, I know that this person is living in Portugal. So why don't I just send him or her a summons to appear in the trial? Or if I need to interview, why don't I send a, a, an European investigation order? So in the first place. Secondly, even when an EAW was issued, because uh, for some reason the court thought that there was a... a, a Normally, I, I must also say that, also say that normally uh, uh, a flight risk is assumed because the person lives in another state. That's it. So the fact that the person is living in abroad is the, the reason for the flight risk. But even if this was done, as soon as the person has been arrested in the executing state, uh, I don't see why uh, we are not using the, the legal possibility that is in the framework decision in Article 18 and 19 uh, to organize an interview by video link of the, the, the person by the issuing state authorities, which could ultimately lead to these same results that I explained. So after, in my case, the guy of uh, eight cannabis plants, this costed a lot of money to remove him to Germany. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, paid by, by Portugal and Germany, you know, by, by the states. So this guy just went there to be questioned and then uh, pay a financial bill of 1,000 euros. This could have been done remotely with a with a video link hearing from Portugal. It would have been possible, but it it did not happen, and it is not used very much, at least not to my knowledge. Maybe other others can have uh, uh, different informations. So I, I think it would be very interesting to explore. I mean, I know yes, they, they have different uh, uh, objectives, but many times the European arrest warrant for prosecution is actually for interrogation or some uh, uh, procedural act which is not necessarily a pretrial detention afterwards. So I think it's, uh, uh, there should be, I'm not sure if we need a new law, I think we just need maybe some um, holistic approach, a kind of a handbook. Uh, we have the handbook, uh, oh yeah, I'm going to finish. We have the handbook on uh, how to issue a European arrest warrant and it also touches upon this uh, issue of proportionality. But I think it would be very interesting to have a kind of a, a handbook or a guideline on how to deal with these medium low criminality cases where it is not likely that imprisonment is, is, uh, uh, is imposed and it is not likely that pretrial detention is imposed at all. So in, in these cases, the approach of how to use and to coordinate these, uh, these uh, different means, either before issuing uh, an EAW or even after you've issued one once the person has been arrested in the executing state. I think this would save a lot of uh, not only uh, disproportionate uh, pretrial detention, but also a lot of uh, uh, cost for the member states because it would avoid these cases where people are just removed and uh, ultimately they, they can just come back home after, after they have uh, been questioned and that's it. Sorry for... <laughs> Thank you, Vanya. Thank you for sharing us uh, all these very interesting stories and also showing the importance of the alternatives. I will quickly move now to one question that we received in the chat for uh, Lucas, and then we will have uh, the break uh, which was foreseen. So the question comes from Christina Peristeridou, who is wondering whether Eurojust has ever advised or encouraged the state authorities that require assistance in EAW cases to use the e, uh, European supervision order instead of uh, the European arrest warrant? Is there any practice developed at Eurojust to discover potential good candidates for European supervision orders? 
thank you, Cecilia. I'll thank you, Christine, for this question. I was just uh, writing you the answer, but if I have the opportunity and orally, I will briefly answer. Um, well, I'm unable to give you a clear answer since simply saying we don't administer this or keep uh, simply statistics on this particular type of advice. So I, I well, I said 4,000 cases last year in the last 20 years uh, might be, uh, it's definitely many more thousands of cases and I cannot exclude that in some of the cases this was discussed. However, uh, what I said in respect to Eurojust cases, and thank you, Vanya, for reflecting this also in your contribution, we really have to distinguish. In serious cases, as I also said, uh, is a question whether this advice could help or, uh, as I said, I'm not sure whether the supervision order is really suitable for the serious crimes. Uh, what, in contrary to that, Vanya said, indeed, there, as uh, the example is given by Vanya, uh, there are cases in the practice where is a question whether the, the other tool uh, shouldn't be used other than EAW. What I can, however, say that in, I can see very, very often, also in Eurojust cases, that this type exactly of assistance is requested, namely interrogation of a suspect and some and request for some procedural actions. Uh, so uh, it's really difficult for, for me without having a clear statistics and data to react. But I, what I can say, if there are conditions to not to apply EAW, this sh simply shouldn't be issued. Uh, that's the point. And if we look at the Euro uh, framework decision on the European arrest warrant, that's maybe where all the confusion comes from. Uh, it has been many times said EAW is for serious cases. However, if we look at the article, I think three or four of the framework decision uh, and the minimal Thank threshold. <laughs> yes, it's uh, we don't speak about serious crimes. Yeah. So yeah uh, thank you <laughs> uh thank you very much we are just a little over time but we still have uh time for for a short break um lord just ca uh, copied the link for the second panel uh into the chat but you should be able to find it also in your emails Thank you very much to all the speakers. It has been very interesting first panel and I hope that you will join us for the second one as well. Um, thanks again to Cecilia for moderating and for all the speakers. Um, um, I, I, I think that um, everybody got a lot of interesting thoughts, thoughts to, you know, developed all the, the interesting thoughts of, of on, and now we can switch to um, second panel on the solutions of possible EU action. Uh, I'll see you in, 10 minutes or so in the second panel. Thanks a lot, everyone.